Hi, John Mellicrummy. I'm a professor at Rice University in the Computer Science Department. My focus area is high performance computing, and the thing that my group is working on mostly these days is actually building this uh, tool that I'm going to talk about, HPC Toolkit. So I'll begin with an obligatory funding announcement. Um, we're supported mostly by the DOE Exascale Computing Project. We also have some funding from the National Science Foundation, a subcontract from Argonne, and one from Livermore. And this is not just my work. This is the work of my, my research group, which includes four PhD research staff and a number of students. So for computational scientists like yourselves, one of the biggest challenges is that these platforms that you're starting to use are uh, rapidly evolving. That uh, the, there's been a shift from multi-core to many-core, and also there's a, a big push to move to systems with uh, accelerators. And so the machines that you're starting to compute on will not be the ones that you, you finish computing on. And there's also increasing parallelism within the, the nodes of these systems. And so as application developers, you need to work to exploit threaded parallelism in addition to MPI to get the most out of, of these systems. You need to leverage vector parallelism to get the most out of the, the arithmetic units in, in the uh, processors. And typically, as you're working on your applications, you're going to be changing them all the time to augment the computational capabilities. And so as you, as you work with your applications, you're going to be trying to adapt them to these, uh, these different architectures. And at the different national laboratories, their flagship architecture is different. And then you're also going to be working to improve the, the scalability both within and across nodes in order to get the most out of these systems. And to do so, you'll have to assess weaknesses in your algorithms and their implementations as impediments to scalability. And so I would argue that performance tools can play an important role as a guide in this process. So some of the challenges that you have for performance analysis are that these architectures have uh, very complex nodes. You have multiple levels of parallelism in that you have multiple cores. Each core has instruction level parallelism inside it. A the cores typically have um, short vector units, uh, SIMD um, parallelism. And then um, on, on some of the systems, like on, on Titan or the emerging systems at uh, uh, at Oak Ridge, the Summit system, or at Livermore, um, the Sierra system, you have accelerators on them. There's a multi-level memory hierarchy. I don't know, I think in the architecture session you probably talked about, about cache and, and memory. As it turns out, memory is about 300 cycles away, and um, cache is just a few cycles away. And if you're not making the most of, of the memory hierarchy, then you're running at the speed of main memory, which is much slower than the processors. And so as a result, the, the typical gap between um, the peak performance and, and what you achieve is, is huge. And so if you want to try and get the most out of this system, you have to invest a little bit of effort into figuring out what's the mismatch between what your application is doing and what the architecture is capable of, and then doing a little uh, adjustment. And so for us, from the tools perspective, complex applications present challenges. Um, there are challenges for measurement and analysis, um, also for understanding the behaviors of your applications and tuning the performance. And on these uh, supercomputers that you're starting to use, they, there's additional complexity. So um, on the, the BlueGene system, there's unique microkernel-based operating system, not just stock Linux. Um, and your performance concerns are beyond just computation. You're interested in optimizing data movement and communication and I.O. if you're trying to get the most out of these systems. So what I would argue that you want is you'd like a multi-platform programming model independent tools, whether you're computing using MPI or whether you're computing using a partition global address space model that makes the system look like a, a, a giant shared memory machine to the first order. Um, you'd like to be able to use the same set of tools, and you'd like to use this whether you're computing on um, something with a, an, an Intel-based architecture or something with uh, IBM processors in it. And you want to do accurate measurement of, of complex parallel codes. So your programs are often large and multilingual. What we see in codes from the national labs is that sometimes they have a C++ framework, but they've got computational kernels in Fortran. There's parallelism both within and across nodes. So 
perhaps OpenMP within the nodes and MPI across the nodes. And sometimes the parallelism within the node is, is heterogeneous. You've got um, accelerators. You've got optimized code, um, loop optimization done by the compiler, inline templates, inline functions. And then something that we have to live with is that often many pieces of your environment are available only in binary form. And so this might be the vendor's OpenMP library or libcuda from NVIDIA if you're using accelerators. And on these systems, we also have some complex execution environments. And sometimes binaries are, are dynamically loaded, um, which means that when you compile them, there's external references to things like the C library and the math library. When you compile things on, on Theta and, and Mira at, at Argon, typically you're producing static binaries which contain everything that your application needs. But our tools are built to, to use um, on either dynamic binaries or on static binaries. And so if you're using it on your cluster at your institution, then you would probably use it on dynamic binaries. So what we've built are some tools for, for effective performance analysis. And, and the goal is to provide insightful analysis that explains what the, the problems are and correlates the measurements with the code. Rather than just having a, a picture that says your performance is terrible, uh, what we want to be able to say is on line seven of the following file, you have a problem and that's costing you a 25% scalability loss. And so associating the performance losses with the code is actually an important part of the tool. And so then our, our goal is uh, scalable to petascale and beyond. And I think there's some still, still some challenges in, um, in scaling our tools and that's what we're working on in, in the Exascale project. So I'll start with um, an overview of HPC Toolkit and then I'll show you some demonstrations on how we use it to pinpoint scalability bottlenecks, um, understand behavior applications over time, um, how we can use it to uh, understand process variability um, or thread variability, understand OpenMP performance, and then uh, a few final remarks. I'll see if I can fit all that in in the remaining 32 minutes. So HPC Toolkit employs binary level measurement analysis. So we're observing fully optimized um, binaries which might be dynamically linked or, or statically linked. We're supporting multilingual codes with, uh, with libraries that are potentially available only in binary form. Um, HPC Toolkit uses sampling-based measurement. And so what that means is that the overhead is controllable. You can set the sampling frequency and that determines how often our tool is, is making measurements in your application. And what sampling does is it minimizes the blind spots in your application. So if you're, if you're rewriting your, your code and adding instrumentation at uh, function, entry, and exit, and you do this for all of your user code, but then you link against a whole pile of libraries, you might miss all the performance information in the libraries. And so our tool just says, you link your application the normal way, and we'll, we'll make some measurements as it runs, and we'll measure the code wherever it came from, whether it's in libraries or whether it's linked directly into your application. So with our tool, you can collect and, and correlate multiple derived performance metrics. So sometimes one metric is enough. If I told you you had a billion cache misses, that's kind of meaningless. What you need to know is, well, how many accesses to the cache did I have? Or um, if I told you you executed um, for a, a billion cycles, then you might want to know, well, how many instructions did I, did I complete? Did I waste my time or did I compute productively? And so often that requires um, having measurements with, with multiple metrics, and then um, you, can, you can compute derived metrics using the metrics that you measure. We associate metrics with both static and dynamic context. By static context, I mean with procedures and with, uh, with loop nests and with inline code. Um, and then dynamic context, I mean call chains, okay? And so if we see that time is spent in MPI weight in something like a coupled climate code, then you need to know whether it's whether you're in MPI weight in the atmosphere portion of the code or the ocean part of the code or something like that. And then finally, our tool supports top-down performance analysis. So you can identify what, what you're interested in and then drill down and focus on the causes. So the, here's a little schematic for the, the workflow for using our tools. So in the first step, you compile and link. And for dynamically linked executables on Linux clusters, you don't do anything. You just use your make files exactly the way they are. Um, on uh, Cray and BlueGene systems that are, that are statically linked, then what that means is you actually have to add our, our HPC link command 
as a prefix to your link line. So if you have an entire command that performs your linking, you just say HPC link in front of it, and what that will do is it'll inject our, uh, our monitoring library into your statically linked execution. And the second step is profiling the execution. And so you launch your optimized uh, application binaries. For dynamically linked binaries, you launch them with our, our launching script, HPC run. So you would say HPC run my application, or MPI run HPC run my application, or however you launch MPI, whether it's with Slurm or, or, um, or with, uh, with, with Cobalt, there's a, there's a way for launching your MPI applications. And all, instead of just launching the application itself, you say HPC run the application. Um, for statically linked binaries, so on, on, uh, on Mira and on Theta, you actually use statically linked binaries, and so you don't use our launcher script. And um, what that means then is that all of the settings that you want to pass into the, to control the monitoring, you pass in as uh, environment variables. And then when the application is running, we're collecting what we call statistical call path profiles. And, and of the events of interest. So what I mean by that is we're going to measure and attribute costs in context. And so you can use either a timer to interrupt the program and um, periodically, or you can use a, a hardware counter and say, I wanna know where I spend my cycles, or I wanna know where I execute instructions. And so I can say, I wanna have a, a counter based on cycles and I want it to periodically interrupt my program to find out where, where I'm executing. And then, Every time this timer goes off, you'll, you'll be at a particular instruction. You'll be at a, an instruction pointer. And so let's say I'm in a routine C when called from B, when called from A, when called from main. And so what we will do at runtime is we will unwind the call stack and find out where you were and how you got there. Okay, so if I'm in MPI wait, I know how I got there. And, and this is just for one interrupt where the sample timer or the hardware counter overflows, we unwind the call chain. And then as the program executes over time, we're gonna keep unwinding the call chain and we're gonna fit all of these things together into a tree. And so conceptually at the top, there's something like main, and then a subtree over here might represent um, the solver, and then there might be an initialization phase and some sort of post-processing phase, and they each have kind of their own context within the tree. And so the result of our monitoring is actually this tree with weights at the various nodes, and the weights indicate how much metric was measured at that point. And so the metric might be cache misses, or it might be cycles or time. And so the important point about this, uh, this measurement technique is that the overhead is proportional to the sampling frequency, not the calling frequency, okay? You get to say, so right now, if, you use, um, if, if you're using this on Theta and you're using the Linux perf measurement subsystem, then you just say, I want to measure with cycles, and then perf will figure out exactly how often it should be interrupting your application. And so it's aiming for about 300 samples per, per second per thread. Okay, so now we've launched the program, we've measured it, we've collected these, these calling context trees. The next step is now we want to interpret our data. So what we have is a binary analyzer called HPC struct. And what this does is it recovers program structure and associates it with, with addresses, machine code addresses in your application. So when we're measuring your application, we're measuring everything in terms of instruction addresses and return addresses inside your application. And now what this HPC struct utility does is it analyzes the machine code, it, it parses the machine code, it identifies branches, it identifies the branch targets, um, it uh, reconstructs the, the control flow, builds a control flow graph, analyzes the control flow graph to find out where loops are, and then we take this information about loops and we combine it with a line map and with whatever information we got from the compiler about inlining, and we, we assemble loop nests and uh, information about inline procedures, and then we map everything in your, your optimized binary, we map it back to the loops and procedures that were in your source code. So if your loop has been torn into several pieces, uh, when we're reporting the performance information, we're just reporting it all back to the same source lines that you had present in your, in your application. And so this is, is pretty unobtrusive. You just say, analyze my binary, and you don't really have to know much about what happens inside here. Then the, the, the next step is once we've collected our call path profile, our dynamic measurements, and we've analyzed the binary, 
then we use a, a tool that combines these, these two sets of, of information. So there's HPC Prof, which is a, a tool that can be used on the head node of these, these clusters to analyze small amounts of information, say from a few threads or a few processes. And then if you want to analyze information about um, a large execution, then you use HPC Prof MPI. And this in itself is an MPI program. Okay? And so if we have profiles from hundreds or, or thousands of, of, uh, of threads and ranks, then you use HPC Prof MPI to say, scoop up bales of these things, analyze all the performance data, and assemble it all into a unified view. And then um, what this, uh, the interpretation tool does is it produces a, uh, what we call a database. It's really just a directory with different kinds of files in it. And then the presentation tools, where there are two. So one is a source code oriented view, and the other is a, a time centric view. And so these, these tools enable you to explore the performance from multiple perspectives, to uh, rank order the, the metric that you think is important, and then compute derived metrics to help you gain insight like scalability loss, graph the thread metrics over, over the, the, the context, and then explore the evolution of behavior over time. So here is uh, our code-centric view. And it looks rather simple, but it turns out that um, it's simple by design, and you can use it to analyze um, measurements on, on a large number of, of threads and ranks. And so what we have here is there's the metric pane, which is whatever we measured. So in this case, we're measuring um, time. And uh, there's inclusive time and exclusive time. So exclusive time is the amount of time I spent in a function. And then inclusive time is the amount of time I spent in a function or things that it calls. And so you can think of the inclusive time as being like a top-down view. And then the exclusive time is what did I do here? And then we have this navigation pane. And so over here, you can click on, on various places in, in the navigation pane. So if I clicked on this function, then it'll bring up the source code up at the top. Here, um, it's showing for the highlighted line, it's showing the source code in, in the top view. And what's interesting about this is, is that there's a, a couple of different ways that you can look at your application performance. You can look at it in this top-down view, what we call the calling context view, where you're looking down complete call chains. The caller view, where you're looking at your performance to say, OK, I spent my time in some function like memcopy. How did I get here? So I can look up call chains to find out how I got to memcopy. And if I spent 50% of my time in memcopy, I can trace down to each call site where I came from how I, how I ended up spending that much time in here. Then there's the flat view, which you can use to just say, well, I want to look at, at uh, a, a particular piece of code, and I don't care how I got here. I just want to know how much time or how much uh, cost was incurred here. And I can look at like the loop nests inside my procedure and decide which ones are important or not. And then there's a couple of um, metric display options. So the flame button is one of my favorites. You just point at something here, and then you hit the flame button, and it will open up call chains and show you like, what the most important thing is. And so the, the rule is, if I open up something and there's some child that accounts for 50% or more of the parent's cost, then you keep on going. And I can point at anything along the way. Um, anything in here, I might uh, click close with a triangle and then point to some sibling and then hit the flame button again to explore some alternate path. And there's a, a, a button here, f of x, for computing derived metrics. So it'll bring up a little pane where you can key in spreadsheet-like formula, and I'll show you how to do that. And then there's a column chooser. So if you collected actually multiple metrics, you might decide that for now I only want to look at one or two and just sort of hide the rest so I'm not horizontally scrolling a lot. And so um, that's convenient as well. So um, an interesting thing about this pane is that while this looks like a call chain, in fact, only the things marked in blue are actual calls. And so inside here, it, there's um, information about a loop. This information about a loop, we're not getting from the source code. We're getting this from looking at the application binary and looking at um, analyzing the machine code and looking at the mappings back to source code. And then here, it shows calls to inline functions. And so this, this bracket i bracket um, designator indicates that this is inline. And this says, at line 3528, there's a call to an inline function. And then inside that inline function, at this line number, there's a call to an inline function. 
And I know that you talked about Raja and you talked about Cocos the other day. In fact, here is Raja templates, a Raja for all template. We can see how the template expands. Inside the template, there's a loop. Um, inside that, there's another uh, inline template, Raja for all, outlined um, a call to an outlined OpenMP function, a loop inside that, and some calls inside that. And so what you really get to see is the full context in which your performance measurements were incurred. And so this works for C++, it works for Fortran, it works for C, or any mix thereof. And so for C++, where you're using inline functions and templates, it's really crucial to be able to see these additional layers of context, because if I was just told I had a call to this function from inside main, and that's the way the compiler left it, I'd have no idea how it got there. OK, so why are we here? We're here for large-scale computing, OK? And so on these large-scale systems, um, as, you, as you run um, on larger numbers of processors, what happens is instead of getting the full benefit of all the processors or a, a parallel efficiency of one, your efficiency drops off. And so that when you get out to a large number of processors or cores, instead you're only getting about 50% efficiency or 15% efficiency on, on the machine. And what you really want to know is, what caused this efficiency to drop off? That's the question we're setting out to answer. So the goal here is that you have some sort of automatic scalability analysis. You want to pinpoint your scalability bottlenecks, guide the users to problems, and quantify the magnitude of each problem. Ideally, we'd also like to diagnose the nature of the problem. Well, I can say that we have the first three are under control. The last one is up to you. Because the nature of the problem, it might be your data structures, it might be your algorithm. And so we can tell you the problem is here, but then you have to figure out what to do about that. And I can show you an example in just a moment, and it'll be clear why we can't tell you exactly what the problem is. All we can do is say the problem is here and it, and it costs this much. So as an example, let's use um, a climate code, OK? And so modern software has many layers of libraries. You might have your application is using the Petsy library, is using the MPI library underneath. The MPI library is using um, the, the C library to perform memory copies and things like that. Your performance is often context um, dependent. And so earlier I mentioned that you might have a climate code and you might have uh, calls to MPI wait in one of the phases. And so rather than knowing that I just spent time in MPI wait, I want to know that the MPI wait in the ocean, um, I'm spending a lot of time waiting in the ocean model. And so that may indicate that I've got some sort of problem with my load balance or, or whatnot inside the ocean phase. So when we're monitoring your application, the bottlenecks might be anything. It could be computation, data movement, synchronization. Um, and so for our measurement tool, we have two pragmatic constraints. One is that we can't record too much data. And the second is we don't want to spend too much time recording data. We want to we want to perturb your execution as little as possible. Otherwise, whatever we're measuring might not be sort of a faithful measurement of, of the performance of your application. So when you run your application, you have, have strong expectations for what it's going to do. Um, you might be performing a strong scaling experiment where you take the same problem and you run it on twice as many processors and you expect it to be twice as fast. Or you might be doing weak scaling where when you double the number of processors, you double the problem size to get higher resolution. So the idea here is that you can put your expectations to work. You can measure the performance under different conditions. For example, at different levels of parallelism or on the, the different input sizes. And then you can express your expectations as an equation and compute the deviation of your expectations for every calling context. That's something that our tool will do. Correlate the metrics with the source code, and then you can explore the whole thing interactively. So um, at a high level, when we're measuring your performance, let's say, on, on P processors, and so here's our calling context tree, and I've I've colored these at different levels of intensity to indicate sort of maybe how much, how much metric accumulated it at any node in the tree. And so I measure it on, say, 256 cores, and then I measure it on 8K cores, and I get a different distribution of where I spent my time. And so, for instance, if I spent 400K units of time in the solver when I did this on 256 cores, and then I took the same problem and I ran it on 8 cores, and then I spent 600K units of time in the solver, then what that would mean is that I've I have a wasted effort of 200K um, units of time. 
I've, I've spent more time in the solver instead of when I took the problem and I split it up on a larger number of processors, I, I invested more total effort in there. And so this, this is, represents wasted effort. And if I divide it through by the total time that I spent on, on Q processors, then I have the fraction of wasted effort. If I multiply by 100, that's percent wasted effort, which is exactly the same as percent scalability loss. Okay. So let's, and, and then if you're doing um, weak scaling, then you can just multiply through some, some coefficients because you're actually doing more work. All right. So let me demonstrate this with a, a canned example that I have on my laptop. So this is um, applying this scalability analysis idea to an adaptive mesh refinement code that does block structured adaptive mesh refinement. It's designed for compressible, compressible reactive flows. Um, it simulates things like helium burning on neutron stars. And here I'm going to use it to analyze uh, a, two executions of a white dwarf detonation. And so this is a, a, a classic piece of data that we measured on Argon's Blue Gene P system that was before the Blue Gene Q. And I use it because it's, it's just such a nice example. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the source code oriented interface. So I'll open the tool and then I'll go look in my demos directory. So what this shows me is I've got a couple of columns here. So there's one column that says, that says 256 cores, wall clock time inclusive, and then so inclusive and exclusive time with 256 cores and inclusive and exclusive time with 8K cores. Now what I did here is I just took measurements from one core of each of these executions. And so if it's a, it was a weak scaling experiment, and so what I would expect is that the time spent in, in each of these executions would be exactly the same. If I, as I increased the number of processors, I increased the problem size. Now, using this interface, I can just go and sort of hunt around and say, okay, so 100% uh, of the time was spent in this code Flash or things that were called from Flash, which is the main program. So that's like a Fortran main. It says that 88% of the time was in driver evolve Flash. And so I can click on the function here and see the function, or I can click on the call site and it will show me where that function was called. This is all for highly optimized code. And then I can go and click the flame button and it'll show me inside driver evolve flash that time was spent in inside a loop. Now when I clicked on the loop, it didn't actually show me a loop header. In fact, the loop header is a couple of lines above. And the reason is that we're mapping back to uh, loops using using um, source line mappings that we got out of the machine code. And sometimes the machine code only shows um, the, uh, the first so source line in the loop where executable code uh, appeared from. Okay, so um, I, can, I can do this for both the, the, uh, the, the columns for the 256 processor execution or the columns based on the 8K processor execution. I can look at um, the bottom up views. So. For instance, if I want to know where I spent my most, the most of my time in my 8K execution, um, I can scroll up to the top and it says, I spent 16% of my time in DCMF protocol multi-send tree reduce short post receive message advance. That doesn't mean anything to you. <laughs> okay. So, but the cool thing is I can just hit my little flame button and say, how did I get here? And, and then I start looking up the call chain, and all of a sudden I see things I re recognize, like PMPI all reduce. Okay, so this is an all reduce, and the all reduces in the program that are important are from the following locations. I can see different places in the program where all reduce is called, and of the 16% of the time that was spent in all reduce, 14.2% of it was spent in MPI AMR comm setup. Okay, so that's just sort of general using the bottom-up view to find out where you incurred your costs. So now let's go back to the top-down view, and now we're going to compute the scalability loss. So I'm going to be doing exactly what I showed you here, where I'm differencing these trees and finding my scalability losses. So I'll take the time on 8K cores, and then I'm going to subtract. And so what I'm doing is I'm just selecting a metric out of the menu. So each of these has uh, a number that's associated with it. Think of it as like the column in a spreadsheet, okay? 
so that I'm subtracting off the time that was spent on 256K cores. And so the difference between the 8K cores and the 256 cores is wasted effort. And I divide through by the total time on 8K cores, and that uses this at sign. So think of it as the dollar applies to every node in the tree, and the at sign only applies to the root. And then um, I multiply by 100. So instead of having the fraction of wasted effort, I have the percent wasted effort, which I said is the same as percent scalability loss. And I'll display this as a percent. And this says I have a 24% scalability loss. Now, if I were to look at this, it says that most of the scaling loss is in driver evolve flash. There's 14% loss in driver evolve flash, 10% in driver init flash. So why don't we just take a look at the losses in driver init flash first, since that's the first thing that the program does. So if I click my flame button, it drills me down into the code and brings me to a spot. And I look at this, and just a couple of lines above, it says do iproc equal 0 to nprocs minus 1. So what this is is it's a loop over the number of processors. As I increase the number of processors from 256 to 8K, now it's more trips around the loop. What's going on here? Well, inside this loop, there's all of these calls to MPI send, receive, replace. So actually what's happening here is this is in the middle of Adaptive mesh refinement, AMR, refine, de-refine, Morton processes using space filling curves to balance the load across the processors. Find surrounding blocks. When I have a block of data that I'm supposed to be computing on, um, I need to know who my neighbors are. And so what it does is it says, these are the blocks that I have, and it passes it to the right. And this passes all the way around a ring. I get to see what everybody has. And by the time it's cycled all the way around, I find out who has the things that I need. And so as I add more processors, the ring gets bigger. So what this is doing is it's doing an, an all to all really, but it's doing it in a way where you don't end up with all of the, da the data at once. Okay, so that's you know, one example here. That was in grid init domain. Now if I look at grid init and say, let's look at where this 1.97% came from. Well, that takes me down into some other place where there's a call to MPI barrier. I see something that looks like do I proc equals. There's reads looking up for the top of the loop. And now we find another loop, iproc equals one to NPEs minus one. If it's my turn, then I open the input file. Another scaling bottleneck, okay? Somebody ran it on something like 20,000 cores. Everybody tried to open the same input file, crashed the system. They said, let's not do that again. So they said, let's, let's take turns, and then forgot about it. Left it there in their application. Okay, well that was in the init flash. One more time in the evolve flash, um, I opened it up and then it, there wasn't anything that was dominant, it came down to the loop. So then I picked the top thing that's in here and used the flame button again and it takes me back to exactly the same place. So the same, um, whoops, the same um, refine, de-refine, Morton process, find surrounding blocks. I'm back in the same place. Okay, so that's, our, that's the way you use this, uh, this top-down interface. <laughs> And so when Anshu Dubé from, um, from University of Chicago was, was informed about this, uh, they said, well, first thing they said is, is that's not my code. We got that, that, that piece of code from NASA. Um, and then they said, well, actually, we could do a little bit better. So instead of like circulating it all the way around uh, a ring, um, we can actually just query our neighbors. And so instead of having the time grow as we increase the number of processors, it stayed flat and was scalable. Okay, so sometimes though, knowing the, the profile isn't enough. You actually, you wanna see um, the, the temporal dimension. And so what can we do? We can trace call path samples. So at um, any point in time, we unwind the call stack and we get some call stack. And then, so at time t, we unwind the call stack on thread one. And then at time t plus delta, we unwind the call stack on thread one, and two delta, and so on. And so we get a series of call stacks for thread one, and for every other thread and every other MPI rank in the application. The idea here is that you have a, a visibility plane. If you lift it all the way up to the top, you would see that everybody is in main or things main calls for the entire execution. And as we move down a little bit, we'll start to see differences between them. So let me just pull up an example here. So this is a code called uh, QMCPAC, which is a materials code, and we were working on this with 
Nick Romero at Argonne. So they had one implementation of QMC pack, and then they were changing it to, to add OpenMP to it. So at the top level, it shows you mostly uniform color. Um, over here, so this is like, this, re this represents program root, or um, moving down one level, it says main. And you find that there's a different color over here, and that's because we have um, this uh, tools interface for OpenMP. And so this just says, indicates that OpenMP threads are uh, idle. So you can't relate idle threads back to a call path. So the, the color is a little bit different. So then um, what we have is on the, the vertical axis, it's ranks and threads. And then the horizontal axis is, uh, represents time. The bottom window represents the, the call stack over time. And um, so this is showing 43 seconds into an execution that's 155 seconds long. There's uh, 31 processes with 31, 31 MPI ranks with 31 threads inside each. And so then um, I can just point it up at a place in the, app, in the execution, and this will tell me the complete call stack at that point in time. And then by moving down um, at different levels of the call stack, I'm getting to see my execution at different levels of abstraction. And so at, once I reach um, an interesting level of abstraction, then I can see that there are differences. Here, this is doing something like QMC update base advanced walker. So this is doing a quantum Monte Carlo code. And then um, in this uh, second phase, this is uh, evaluating Hamiltonians. And so um, I don't have much time to, to go through this interface, but it turns out that by, by looking at this and like looking all the way down at the bottom and finding out what you're spending your time doing, um, uh, it turns out that red down here is, uh, represents time spent in, in uh, If I add something here, it, it will. So say, look for time that's spent inside the Intel runtime system, and let's color it bright red. And and, and as we look, we find that, that um, some fraction of our, oh, and then this, this green is schedule yield, so I should color that yet red as well. So that's saying that um, I'm giving up the processor. I'm just coloring in sort of red for convenience. And so what, what this is showing me here is everything that is, that is now colored red represents bad stuff. This represents basically wasting my time. And now what we find is that we're wasting 50% of the time. Okay. This is what you can find out from, from this interface. And that is we look at the execution over time. In fact, we see, well, there's this setup phase. And then for the rest of the execution, we just waste our time. <laughs> you can find this out about your code too. <laughs> You'll be surprised. So one of the things that we've spent a lot of time doing over the last couple of years is that for OpenMP, um, if you don't use a special interface inside the OpenMP runtime, you'll, you'll see a view that represents um, an implementation level view. So the OpenMP compiler will tear loop nests out of your program and put them in separate functions. And you'll see something here where um, this looks like um, KMP launch worker is calling launch thread, is calling invoke task, and then these are some things that you never wrote in your program. They've been like, they're machine generated, they're compiler generated routines. And so what you really wanna know is like, how did I get here? And how did I, and I wanna understand these routines in context. And so we built this um, OpenMP tools interface. We started on this process with, uh, in a collaboration with IBM when, when Mirror was originally purchased. And we've been working on this since 2012 and making it part of the OpenMP standard. And so as part of OpenMP 5, when it's released in November, it will have a tools interface. And what the tools interface will, will enable us to do is to paper over the differences between the master threads and the worker threads and show you a source code oriented view of your application. So we've, we've designed this uh, standardized tools interface and some of the tools around the, the, the room that you'll hear about today are, are starting to use this. And so in our uh, HPC toolkit, this is the source code oriented view. 
And now what we're seeing is that the, the OpenMP routines that were torn out of the application are shown sort of in the full calling context that we see that the time is in, incurred in this OpenMP routine. And then we're also able to graph like thread and process views to see this, the, the variability of the amounts of time that are spent in, some of the threads are spending a lot of time and other threads are doing nothing, okay? And so there's, this, there's a, a knob for this, uh, this thread level view as, as well. Um, and so it's not shown in this version of the interface, but um, there's a, a knob there in the version that you could use. And so then this is showing um, the, a, a trace level view for an OpenMP um, code. This is a, an algebraic multigrid code. And so things of note here, we're inside some phase in, uh, so th these are like MPI ranks and then there's a set of OpenMP threads. So there's, uh, there's four MPI ranks and eight OpenMP threads. And so for these regions where all of the threads are colored the same, then that means that everybody's working together executing OpenMP. Where it's gray here, that means the OpenMP threads are idle. So that means this is a piece of serial code, okay? So from this, level, from this view, you can find out that you've got serial code. But also, we have something that we call blame shifting that's integrated into our tool, where when a thread is waiting for work, we, we blame the, the thread that's, we, we, we blame the, the code that's executing um, in, in serial for not shedding enough parallelism to keep us busy. And so um, you can measure OpenMP idleness and say, I want to measure in uh, cycles, and I also want to measure OpenMP idleness. And then if we measure OpenMP idleness, then we can find that routine where it was green. It says that 50% uh, of the idleness in the program is attributed to this function. And what that means is that threads were idle when I was spending my time here. Okay, I'm pretty much out of time. So um, we're working on integrating this with, uh, with the OpenMP tools interface, which is going to be released in, in uh, the upcoming version of, of uh, OpenMP in November. Right now, we have a prototype of the interface that you can try today, and there's some more directions in, in here on how to do that. We can measure hardware counters using Linux perf events on theta with uh, frequency-based sampling and hardware event multiplexing, so you can measure lots of metrics all at once. Um, and in fact, we can also sample activity in the kernel on the platforms at Argon. It's not so easy, but on other platforms you can. And so some of the ongoing work we have are uh, improving support for uh, measuring GPU accelerated nodes. Um, we can attribute costs for code executing on the GPU back to full calling contexts, associating costs with data, and some more automation of analysis to deliver performance insights. I'd be happy to answer a couple of questions. Yes. How do we generate the, the HPC trace view? Is it similar to doing HPC view on the output of HPC prof, or is it so? What, so what you do is when when you say uh, when you when you run the code, you'll you'll either say HPC run your application, or you'll you use the environment variables if you have a statically linked application. Okay, and so when you let, let's say I wanted to to sample using um, time. Okay, so I could sample, say my event is real time, and then, um, and then I say dash T, collect a trace along with that. And so what we're collecting is a trace of samples. And you might think that this is a lot of data, but it's only about 12 bytes per sample because what we're finding out is that at time T, we're at node 17 in this tree, and that implies the whole path to root. So all we need is like the node number and, and the time. And so you get that by just saying dash T with whatever else you're measuring, and it will collect the trace automatically. And then when you run HPC prof MPI, it will produce both the source code oriented view and the trace oriented view. Okay, and then you just visualize that with HPC trace viewer. Yes? I've seen that when I use HPC view, HPC prof, I also get calls to the MPI calls in my code. So what is the difference between HPC prof and HPC prof? MPI. Um. Ah, so the, the only thing, the only difference is HPC prof is for analyzing small amounts of data. But if you run something on, say, theta and you collect data on 100 nodes on, on 20 threads, you don't want to analyze that all sequentially. So you, you launch HPC prof MPI exactly the way you would launch HPC prof, but you launch it using your MPI launcher, okay? And then it's going to run on the compute nodes of the cluster and analyze all the performance data faster. Okay, other questions?
Yes. Are there any tools to analyze data movement, like cash misses? So you can say, I want a sample based on cash misses, and that just comes up as one of the metric columns. So cash misses work the same way as time. OK? Yes. I've encountered issues in the past using some debuggers where the behavior of some MPI calls would change depending on where I put my breakpoints. And I wonder, with these with sampling you know, in the middle of an execution, have you observed anything quite like that? Or is that a risk at all? Something I should be concerned about? So, so let's just say it's not supposed to happen. Okay, It's not supposed to be any different. However, um, for... Mira, when IBM delivered the software stack for, for Mira, uh, it turned out that they had race conditions in their, their PEMI MPI layer. And so um, anytime you were in PEMI multicast, if we interrupted it with sampling, we could disturb the race condition and it would break. That's not supposed to happen. So we spent some time with IBM figuring out exactly what the problem was, and we fixed it for PEMI multicast. It turns out there may be other problems in there. So one of, the, one of the pieces of advice is you can turn off IBM's optimized but incorrect collectives using an environment variable that says run the slower version because it's safe. So sampling is not supposed to, to, to make any changes to your program. If your program is incorrect, it can expose race conditions in it. And we've seen that with, with IBM's MPI. OK. Yes. When you diff the call trees to get, for example, uh, the parallel efficiency, uh, do you deal with differences in the call trees somehow? Absolutely. So in fact, uh, when, you ran it, you, when you run on different problem sizes, in fact, your, your call trees might be, might be slightly different because you may even have cases that says, well, if it's this problem size, I, uh, like, you know, maybe if, if my matrices are large enough, then I use some other strategy for solving them. And so that will show up in, in the differences, but it, it's most useful if, if uh, you're, you're using the same algorithm for both. Because otherwise, it will show up as there was none of it in this tree, and there was a lot of it in that tree, and it looks like a scalability loss, but really it was just an algorithm change. Okay, So you have, to, you have to sort of be careful as you're interpreting it. I'm also talking about small differences, like not fundamental differences. Oh, the, the small differences, yes. There will always be small differences. And if there are small differences, then that just doesn't show up as something important when you, when you do the analysis. There was another question here. Oh, could, uh, last question. OK. <laughs> can, can you work with uh, Python plus MPI plus GPU code? So we, we haven't tried with that, that full stack. So as for Python, um, we don't attribute to Python source code. You, what you would probably see is the Python interpreter. Um, yeah. Most of our funding has been from the DOE, and up until recently, Python wasn't something that they cared about very much. So we haven't spent a lot of, of effort. The, the Tau tool will, uh, will actually map things back to, to, to Python. So you, you, yes, I think you can use that. If you want to try that today with me, I'd be happy to, to try that with you.